we can do it! That's the motto for Mars and Virgo. Next on Horoscope Highlights. This podcast episode is sponsored by Astrology Hub's Academy. Wherever you are on your astrology journey, we have a class that will help you get to the next level. Hello, my name is Christopher Renstrom, and I'm your weekly horoscope columnist here on Astrology Hub. And this week, I wanted to talk to you about Mars entering the zodiac sign of Virgo on July 10th. Mars, as you may already know, is the planet of gumption and drive in astrology. It's the planet that, if it sees something that it wants, it goes ahead and grows right on after it. So Mars is a striver and an arriver. It's the planet that's going to fight for what you want in your life. If you have a strong Mars, that Mars is going to say, buck up, don't be so demure and self-deferential. Go stand at the head of the line where you belong. Mars's mission statement in astrology is to get you whatever you want. That's Mars working in a constructive or a positive way. Mars working in a negative way can be very combative and can be very conflict-ridden, and in some regards even invite attack if you don't have a very strong or a very assertive Mars. So uh, when we look at Mars traveling through a zodiac sign, Mars is going to do two things. The first thing it's going to do is bring out the strengths that reside within that sign. For instance, if you're born under the zodiac sign of Aquarius, and you may have very strong technical and maybe even scientific abilities, Mars is going to strengthen those faculties within the sign. The second thing that Mars can also do in a sign is that it will bring out the conflicts that are associated with that sign. A bit of a dilemma, actually, if you think about it. The more that you assert yourself, or Mars asserts itself by traveling through a zodiac sign, the more it's going to bring out conflicts that are being expressed themselves in tandem with the assertion. For instance, Mars in Aries. We know that Mars in Aries is very vigorous, it's very driven, it's very athletic, it will fight uh, for what it wants, and so that can be a very good thing. But in fighting for what it wants, it's going to bring about conflict because maybe what it wants is what somebody else wants, or whatever it's fighting for to gain comes at the loss of someone else. The other thing to keep in mind about Mars, and really the two malefics in general, Mars and Saturn, is that the malefics never know when to dial it back. Once they're set in a mode, they keep on going in that mode. Once Mars is 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 driven and ready to fight for what it wants, it's not going to cool down or calm down. Even if it gets what it wants, there's still a part of it that is charged up and and, and, and going forward. Saturn has a tendency to withhold and keep something away. And so Saturn, once it starts doing that in an astrological chart or by transit, will work very strongly to withhold something no matter what one does to try to wrangle it free of Saturn's grip. Saturn just never knows when to let up. Saturn believes that you can never be disciplined enough. So the malefics have a hard time moderating their their impulses. And and part of what makes them malefic, or what can make them very difficult to deal with, is that they really don't know how to relax that effort. And that's why you have other planets to intervene and say like, Hey, Mars, lighten up, or Saturn, maybe it's time to share. Okay, Th- those those sorts of things. Now, when we look at Mars entering a zodiac sign like Virgo, what you want to do is really first look at the sign. Virgo, we know, is a zodiac sign that's very much involved with women and with women's issues and with women's rights. Of all the 12 signs of the zodiac, Virgo is the only zodiac sign that is depicted as a woman. It can be questioned or debated that we don't really know the gender of the crab, the scorpion, and the fish, but for the most part, Virgo is pretty much the only zodiac sign that depicts a woman. This is very important 
because the Virgo rules over women, women's uh, collectives, women's groups, sisterhood, basically women who are doing it for themselves. And what it comes from is an earlier time in our society when uh, women were secondary uh, in, in, in rank. And so um, this idea of, or this question of how, as a woman, can you live in a man's world is very much an integral question and theme for the zodiac sign of Virgo. Now, one might think, okay, well, Mars and Virgo is going to be like, you know, unite and come together and let's protest and, you know, take back the night or something along those lines. That is going to be very aggressive and it's going to be very, you know, and all these sorts of things. But that's not really the way that Mars works in the zodiac sign of Virgo, because mostly Virgo is a zodiac sign that doesn't really assert itself in a combative way. Virgos, uh, like the women that that the sign symbolizes, uh, tend to be more shrewd, working with uh, the resources that are available to them. You are going to find strategies. You're going to find other ways of getting what you want so that you can avoid being carted off to jail um, or, or knocked down where you stand and you can actually win the game. And hopefully, if you're using your Virgoan wits, you can hear that Mercury is the ruler of Virgo there. If you're using your Virgoan wits, you can win a prize without an anyone ever knowing that you won it. Okay, so this is kind of the ultimate sort of Virgoan victory here. So Virgo is the zodiac sign of women and women's bodies. It is the sign of work, health, and service, also, Virgo represents the working class, the people who don't really have much of a say in the way that things are done, but who are doing all the work nonetheless. When you think of labor and Virgo, it makes perfect sense because uh, Labor Day, for instance, is celebrated in the season of Virgo. So Virgo is the person that people kind of take for granted but wouldn't know what to do without should they, I don't know, go on strike or walk out or not be available or decide not to take up jobs, something that we're all uh, confronted with nowadays in our society. So this reliance upon Virgo is something that Virgos deliberately cultivate. Uh, Virgo may not sit on the throne. Virgo may not rattle the sword. Virgo may not be like, what the hell do you think you're doing? Okay, uh, uh, that sort of a thing. But Virgo will outwit, it will outthink, and it will strategize. The other thing that's very important to Virgo is making itself indispensable. All Earth signs are afraid of being kicked to the side of the road. So this is something that's in the back of all Earth signs. And so what's important for the earth signs is to make themselves valuable through their work. And when you think of a servant and an employer, a servant, if they're very smart and good, make themselves so indispensable to an employer that the employer will never fire them. And in fact, the employer might even delegate certain responsibilities to the servant so that they don't have to think about them or be bothered by them. When you're also looking at uh, a sign like Virgo, you want to look at the element. And the element of Virgo, of course, as I already mentioned, is earth. So the easy way to think of an earth sign is health and wealth. These are the two things that matter most to an earth sign. Um, earth signs are haunted by the question, how do I live in a world where everything ultimately falls apart? Which is why earth signs are so fixated on food in the refrigerator, money in the bank, and a roof over their head, and a bed to call their own. So, so that's part of the focus of the earth signs. The other focus of the earth signs, Virgo in particular, is that they are results-oriented. All right, so earth signs don't talk about what they're going to do one day. They don't like dream about how things could be if only this were different or if that were to happen. What earth signs really do is put the shoulder to the wheel. An earth sign is very happy when they get um, something that is of value at the end of the day for their effort, something they can weigh in the palm of their hand, like money or food or what whatever has value to them. They can weigh it in the palm of their hands at the end of the day. They're happy campers. So, so with a Mars in Virgo, 
there's going to be a very strong emphasis on work, and there's going to be a very strong emphasis on producing results. So, you know, winning the prize or winning the trophy, Mars in, in Virgo is going to be showing results. This is what I got done today. And, and particularly because Virgos are so in love with their to-do lists, uh, checking off every item of that to-do list, and then end of the day, victory. Okay, um, that's a Mars in Virgo. They're going to be very, very happy with those results. The other thing that we need to remember about a zodiac sign when Mars is traveling through it is what kind of a sign is it? Is it cardinal, fixed, or mutable? Virgo, we know, is a mutable sign. What that means is it's adaptable. It doesn't have just one idea and I have to pursue it and achieve it, you know, and 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 get it at the end no matter what. It doesn't have an, an inflexible stance, meaning that they will work with the circumstances or the situation as it unfolds. This is what makes a sign like Virgo, for instance, very improvisational. We're not kind of used to thinking of Virgo as being improvisational. It's very improvisational. It's a Mercury-ruled sign. So like its sibling sign, Gemini, Virgos think of their feet. And they're always working with what's what they have there in front of them. So when you've got a Mars in Virgo that's adaptable, where Mars sometimes can get very focused, like a heat-seeking missile on hitting its target, a Mars in Virgo is able to be like, you know what? This isn't working. Let me try a different avenue. Okay, so a Mars in Virgo is willing to try on different modes or try out different approaches in order to get what it wants. And that kind of lends a multitasking um, aspect to the Mars and Virgo that you might not see in other uh, signs that Mars is traveling through. The other thing to remember with Virgo is that it is ruled by the planet Mercury, which rules the mind. And so, um, so as I said, there's a cleverness, there's a shrewdness, there's um, a guile, there's a wile um, that can work with the Mars in, in Virgo. Um, and, and again, what makes uh, Mars in Virgo different from, for instance, Mars in Gemini is that, first of all, Mars in Virgo is pretty much going to do it by themselves, whereas Mars in Gemini might work with someone else. The other thing is that the Mars in Virgo is, is results-oriented. We can also add to it a sort of efficiency and economy in its actions. It wants to reduce uh, the strategy to the basic points that you need, and it's not really interested in questioning uh, this or that as much as it is if this part of the equation isn't working, what can I substitute it with? All right, so... So that's very much um, a Mars and Virgo. You can almost think of a Mars and Virgo as a contestant on on one of those baking shows where it's not going as planned with the recipe and then they have to improvise on the spot and make something of the disaster that's unfolding. That's very much a Mars and Virgo. And not only do they make something of that disaster, they might even improve on what the original game plan was. A Mars in Virgo is always ready for a fight. Now, that doesn't mean it's looking for a fight. What it means is that it's ready to fight, all right, if it has to. So with the Mars and Virgo, if you combine it with the idea of Virgo, which is always sizing up what the possibilities and the resources and what's available and how to use it uh, with Mars, uh, which can be combative, a Mars and Virgo doesn't go into a fight unprepared. It's thought out ahead of time how this fight or conflict is uh, going to be resolved. And so there's, again, I've been using that word strategy, a strategic element to the Mars and Virgo. What we need to remember with the Mars and Virgo is that um, Virgo, for instance, because it's Mercury ruled, can have a lot of restless or nervous energy. And so that can make the Mars a bit more hyper, for lack of a better word, or a bit more nervous, you know, um, maybe even abrupt, or, 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 or as I was saying, malefics have, have a hard time gauging themselves. Uh, it can make it very, you know, talk very fast or move very fast or, fast or act very fast. And so what you may really see uh, with the Mars and Virgo organizing its space or organizing its office or desk or closets or whatever is its way of centering itself. It's its way of managing a lot of that sort of mental 
stress or duress that 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 can get out. And it needs to be mentally engaged because if it's not, it can wind up creating a lot of trouble for itself. Um, it can it can it can overthink. It can put something together, find something wrong with it, take it apart, put it back together, find something wrong, take it apart. You know, it's almost like it's scratching itself or or whatever that that it needs to be engaged or it can get destructive. I wanted to sort of circle back here and and talk about this this image of women and Mars and work and something that comes to my mind whenever I think of Mars and Virgo, especially because Mars is named after the Roman god of war, I think of Rosie the Riveter. And Rosie the Riveter, in case you're not familiar with her, was this kind of like, I think it was Westinghouse that put out this ad, but but it's the woman flexing her muscle and she's wearing a bandana and a jeans overalls. And basically during World War II, Many men went off to fight the war. They were soldiers in the war, but then there was no one to really run the factories or to be working on the assembly lines. And so women, mostly middle-class women, but it was actually women from all ethnicities and all backgrounds, came and worked uh, in the war factories, and they kept those factories going. I mean, America would not have been able to do what it did in World War too, if it hadn't had the Rosie the Riveters, you know, women who were in the assembly lines were putting together the different parts of an airplane or tank or guns or whatever munitions or whatever was being shipped off. So this was a very different image from nurses, for instance. These were women who were who were going into the factory and taking over the, the positions of men. Now, the myth was that when men returned from the war, that the women had lost their jobs even happily given up their jobs and returned home to be happy homemakers and become the June Cleavers of all 1950s sitcoms or something along those lines. But that's not what really happened. The reality is that the number of working women never again fell to pre-war levels. In other words, the women stayed employed. They were housewives and they were working at the factories. And, And there's no loss of those numbers that is shown statistically, and this comes from the Library of Congress. So the recognition that middle-class married women could work and run a home was significant. Now, of course, poorer women had been doing this all their lives. This was nothing new for them. But this is something that really brought in the the largest swath of, of women. And without being a big deal, it changed the economic landscape of the United States of America coming out of World War II. A lot of people feel like that had planted the seeds for the second wave of feminism, you know, in the 60s and things like that. But no, those adjustments had already been made in the workplace. Now, again, these weren't women who were being CEOs of companies or something along those lines. But these were women in the factories and women who were working on the assembly lines. And when you remember Mars is associated to metal and to war and to factories and working with metal and metal works, Rosie the Riveter becomes quite a compelling image. Now, I want to share with you this quote. This quote comes from Rosie the Riveter, a woman who was working in the munitions factories during World War II. And it comes from the Library of Congress. And she says, quote, My mother warned me when I took the job that I would never be the same again. She said, you will never want to go back to being a housewife. At that time, I didn't think it would change a thing. But she was right. It definitely did. At Boeing, I found a freedom and an independence that I had never known before. After the war, I could never go back to playing bridge again, being a club woman, when I knew there were things you could use your mind for. The war changed my life completely. I guess you could say at 31, I finally grew up. And then here's another quote. You came out to California, you put on your pants and took your lunch pail to a man's job. That was the beginning of a woman's feeling that they could do something more. I wanted to share with you this example because it's Mars coming into the zodiac sign of Virgo. It's a woman's sign and making these women feel 
empowered, but also, you know, putting them to work. And once there's this 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 sense of work, this sense of camaraderie, not wanting to go back to these pigeonholed existences in suburbia and wanting to be of use and obviously wanting to make their own money at the same time. So with with Mars and Virgo, uh, it, it it can make you feel or or see yourself as serving. Mars and Virgo is kind of a soldierly placement. Uh, we we kind of think like, oh, maybe that should be Mars and Aries or Mars and Leo or something like that. It's soldier. It's a soldier's placement because of the regimental quality of it. A Virgo is very rank and file. It's very ordered. There's a regiment to to be followed. And so with Mars and Virgo, if you have it in your chart, or you may be experiencing this with the transit, um, you see yourself as serving, um, and 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 you feel yourself like this. It, it's a humility of service, of course, but it's also the importance of obeying orders and that that being um, a very important thing. So if you have, for instance, Mars and Virgo in your chart natally, you will often perform better when there is a regiment or when there is a structure. So if someone gives you an order or someone gives you an assignment or someone gives you a task, that's delightful to someone with Mars and Virgo. Then you know what to do. And you will go and you will execute that task to the best of your to the best of your ability. And if you have Mars and Virgo, your ability is probably better than most. But what I've also seen show up with people who have Mars and Virgo natally is that they will often <clears throat> perform the task better than what was originally ordered. They go beyond the call of duty, or the excellence of their work is so good that it was better than what the superior had in mind. And that perfectionism is very much associated to a Mars and Virgo, but that perfectionism can also become a bit unsettling when you show off in your excellence of work that you know the work better than the superior does, and that your sense of how it could be done is is uh, superior to the superiors. And this is why bosses and employers are very fortunate that people who have Mars and Virgo are very obedient. There's no very strong need to take over. They want the security of the job or the routine to do what they do. That doesn't mean that they always stay down. They find ways to push the envelope and usually without the manager or the superior or the client or the person in charge knowing. For someone with a Mars and Virgo, if a client says, that's better than I thought it could be. That's really, wow, that's really impressive. Let's go with that. The Mars and Virgo is winning that recognition, but also winning that ability to make something better by showing what they can do rather than saying, I can make it better. Or, you don't know how to do this. Uh, Mars and Virgo is going to do it through the work, let the work speak for itself, and then very subtly push a client's idea of what a project should be or an assignment is more in the direction that the Mars and Virgo person has in mind, again, without ever confronting or making the person feel uh, feel bad. The other thing that we see with Mars and Virgo and that you may experience by transit as well is a real earnest motive to help people to help themselves. Virgo is a very self-sufficient zodiac sign all the earth signs strive to be, but with Virgo, it's important because it's coming from the history of women in Western civilization. The more that you could be self-sufficient or accountable to yourself and not beholden to someone, the more that you could uh, put that in your corner or, or be self-sufficient, the better off things would be for you. So, so a Mars and Virgo is very much about helping people to help themselves. Like, Aries, there's a coach quality to it or a training quality to it. And Mars and Virgo, of course, because of its association with laborers and the underclass, is all about championing the underdog. I think it's fascinating. Mother Teresa had her son and Mars in Virgo. And this is someone who was famous for her street ministries. She lived basically on the streets with the poor and administered to the poor, showing them how they could 
help themselves. She wasn't just doling out, you know, food and things like this. She she went to uh, the the poor who were on the streets, the disenfranchised, and she helped them to help themselves. That was her ministry. It was very one on one very with someone, showing someone how they could better themselves or improve their life circumstances. And that comes from Mercury, the ruler of Virgo, was the god who was referred to as being the companion to man. Uh, we know it as Mercury helps you get from here to there. It's the deity that if you were to meet it on the street and ask directions, it would show you where to go. But the companion to man is that Mercury in his activities that he performed, he was always on earth. He was always in the market. He was always with people. And so where other gods were in their temples or their art altars or sacred groves, you could bump into Mercury on the street. So that companionable quality is very much something you see in Virgo and you also see in the sibling sign of, of Gemini. Before I wrap, I want to talk to you about an upcoming opposition. This is when Mars in Virgo opposes Saturn in Pisces on July 20th. This is a pretty significant opposition that's going to be taking place between the two planets. And I wanted to break that down very quickly. An opposition isn't about balancing energies, okay? When, when one planet is opposed to another planet in the chart, there's no balancing or even reconciliation that's going to take place. They are polarized. They are in opposite corners or sides of the chart. Best example that I like to use is the current state of our Congress, right? People say, well, hopefully we can find something bipartisan, but it's uh, it's very rarely bipartisan. I mean, the Republicans are the Republicans in this corner and the Democrats are the Democrats in this corner, and there will be no there there will be no budging, there will be no bridge building that takes place. So so basically this is how an opposition works. They're not inclined to help one another out, and they're not inclined to have anything to do with one another. So an opposition by transit, like for instance, when you have Mars and Virgo opposing Saturn and Pisces, and what I mean by transit is that's where they're, they are in the sky right now. An opposition, more often than not, by transit will bring an ending or something to an end. It's literally, you can see a line of summation being drawn, and the numbers added up, and this is the conclusion. It can be like, ah, we got to the other side of this project and assignment, and and it's out of our hands now. We, we've done our part. Now it's in the hands of someone else, a superior or a client or something along those lines. Or it can be like, I've done everything that I could possibly do to keep this relationship going, and, and you've done everything that you could do to keep this relationship going, and maybe we're just not meant to be in this relationship, and we should go our separate ways. It's an important distinction because with a square, you still have a dog in the fight. You know, you're still fighting two. You may be making one another's lives li miserable or something, but you're still fighting to win or to accomplish or to collaborate or something. With an opposition, there's no fight. It's just uh, there. there's no budging from these opposite corners. There's no budging from these opposite positions. The dynamic of the opposition is going to be Mars is all about pushing. So Mars in Virgo is going to push for something that it wants. And Saturn in Pisces, Saturn is all about withholding or withdrawing, okay? So the more that you, you know, push a Saturn, you know, hey, I want this. The more Saturn withdraws or withholds, you're not going to get this. And so what can happen and what you may feel around this July 20th opposition or in the days building up to it is that the more that you push for something that you want from someone else, the more that that person withholds it from you. And of course, the more that that person withholds it from you, the more you're going to push. And you could be one of the two sides of this equation. You might be the person who's pushing and the other person's withholding, or you might be the person who's withholding. So this can be the way that the opposition plays out. What happens in an opposition in your chart natally, and it can even happen by transit, you can only play one of the two roles of these two planets. Okay, so if you're the one who's pushing, you're the one who's pushing, the other one is withholding. Let's say you're like, okay, now I'm gonna like walk over and be the one who's withholding. Then you will attract someone who's pushing. <laughs> okay, so the way that an opposition works is you're one or the other. 
Okay, so either you're represented as one planet in the opposition, and the and the um, other is represented as the other planet in the opposition, or you can swing like a pendulum between the two placements, especially if you have it natally. You might be Mars for a little while, and then you switch to the Saturn. You might be Saturn for a little while, and then you switch to the Mars. So there's no bridge that's being worked out here. There's no common ground. There's no bipartisan ship in a true opposition. And what I mean by a true opposition is that there are no aspects in the natal chart that are helping it out, like for instance, with a sextile or a trine. You may feel, for instance, if you're feeling the Mars and Virgo, is that you may feel like you're trying to help someone to help themselves, like you're trying to fix a problem. And that the more you try to fix the problem, the person on the opposite end of the seesaw from you, and I want you to think of an opposition between planets as being kind of a seesaw. Okay, you need someone in each one of the seats or, you know, it crashes. Okay, so so the more that you push or you're trying to help someone to help themselves or you're trying to figure out a solution, the more the other person's going to be the Saturn and Pisces, which is you can't fix it. Nothing can be done here. And so you can see where that would make the Mars and Virgo very, you know, like, yes, I can. And let me figure out an approach or another approach or another way of handling this. I, I have to be able to. So on one hand, it's very thwarting and it's very frustrating to have someone like, can't be solved. It can't be helped. I'm sorry. But then on the other hand, it could also be very motivating. This is a, a Mars and Virgo, which is stimulated by a problem. You know, Virgos believe that all problems can be solved. <laughs> you know, Pisces doesn't necessarily believe that all problems can be solved. And I'm not saying that there's a helplessness to Pisces. There isn't. But Pisces is comfortable with a problem being a problem. And that perhaps the illumination is in the problem or that we must live with this problem or this burden or this difficulty. Not all Pisces are like this. That isn't the whole uh, part of Pisces that's going to come out. It is a part of Pisces that's going to come out when you have Saturn in Pisces. Okay. So with Saturn in Pisces, which lends itself to a depressed energy or depression, you have on one hand, what could be a very nervous, frenetic Virgo, Mars and Virgo. And then you can have a depressed and almost feeling of helplessness with the Saturn in Pisces. And again, you can switch between the two. You might be very frenetic one day and then depressed and like helpless the next and then frenetic and back on your feet one day. That's if you have it natally in your chart. Or that might be what you're experiencing in a relationship or an association or a friendship or just with a, a dilemma. Okay. So the, the Saturn in Pisces side is like, well, you know, I keep picking holes in, in the person's argument and finding the things that are wrong and why they can't do this, but maybe something can be done. <laughs> you know, so so the more that the demands are made um, on the Saturn and Pisces or, or, or the person keeps coming back to the Saturn and Pisces with like, well, let's try this, let's try that, let's, let's try this. And Saturn and Pisces like, no, no, can't be helped, can't be done. But Saturn and Pisces might also at the same time be like, well, maybe maybe something could happen. You know, they, they start to imagine or they start to visualize how, how something could be. So, so even though the two planets in opposition aren't going to find a common ground, they are having an impact on uh, one another. But the Saturn and Pisces, the message can be with Saturn and Pisces, what do you do with something? You know, what do you do with a situation if it can't be helped, you know? Remember, Mars and Virgo is going to be like, it can be helped, a problem can be solved. But Saturn and Pisces is, is naturally going to be more profound. Like, what do you do with a situation if it can't be helped? What do you do with a problem if it can't be solved? And that doesn't mean, you know, you accept it, although there, there, there can be, there can be like, okay, we have to accept this as a condition, you know, like maybe I have a chronic pain or something and I have to live with this and I have to accept that, you know, as something that I weave into my life. So there can be an acceptance that can come through that. But there can also be a patience. Uh, there can also be a willingness to let something 
be or to let life unfold, to let developments unfold and maybe, you know, find a way to live with it, or maybe they do lead to something, but it's going to be outside of the frenetic pace of solving a problem with all the speed and rapidity of being on a game show. So Saturn and Pisces has a tendency to see things more deeply than a Mars and Virgo. Mars and Virgo, you want to think of sort of, sort of almost as a stopwatch. They've got X amount of time to do this, okay? And Saturn and Pisces can step outside and be like, we've got all the time in the world to do this. And it can reflect, it can contemplate, it can really sit with a matter. It may even transform a matter from being a problem or a mistake into something that is a lesson or or illuminating, an experience that is illuminating. Things that happen when you take it outside the uh, structure of a problem that needs to be solved. This is where you have a very different way of looking at problems uh, from the point of view of a Saturn in Pisces. Remember, Pisces is the mystic, and so it's more with the idea of contemplation or really sitting with something for for a long time and seeing what emerges on its own or through through reflection. Nevertheless, this opposition between Mars and Saturn isn't fixed. In other words, the planets are moving in the sky, and this is what you always want to look for when you have oppositions even in your own chart. They don't stay there because planets are always in motion in the sky, and so they're always forming sextiles or trines, ways that can work as outlets or as channels or as redirections for that energy in your chart. And the same is going to be true of this by transit. There will be three opportunities to bridge this gap between Mars and Saturn. And those opportunities, actually the best one, the best one will occur on August 1st, and that is when Mars and Virgo forms a trine to Jupiter and Taurus. That's the best planetary transit because the trine breaks up the opposition. Jupiter also happens to rule Saturn and Pisces, which is opposing the Mars. And so August 1st might be really, really good for finding your way around what feels like an impossible situation may provide the means of either looking at it differently or finding a way around or maybe even help from from a distant quarter. Your two other really good times are going to be August 16th when Mars trines Uranus. That's very inventive. And August 24th, when Mars forms a trine to Pluto retrograde in Capricorn. That's probably when whatever dilemma you may be facing, this standoff that you're facing, it's probably going to be ultimately resolved on August 24th, when Mars forms its trine to Pluto retrograde in Capricorn. And so there you have it. Things to think about while Mars is in the zodiac sign of Virgo from July 10th until August 27th. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Horoscope Highlights. Please don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. Your support means a lot. See you next week.